Um, what I thought we will basically do, first of all, is to first briefly recapitulate or summarize what we saw in the last class. We discussed a lot of concepts, and I will begin spending the first five or so minutes with just quickly recapitulating where we were before we went forward, right? So what we are fundamentally trying to do is to not make you into a researcher or anything, but basically give you the skill to be able to look at journal articles that might interest you. I'm not talking about esoteric things or rare or strange things that you wouldn't care about. Journal articles that will interest you and see, you know, ultimately, is this something you can incorporate into your practice? Journal reading should never be a sterile exercise. It should not be something like you read it and put it away. All journal clubs and journal reading, at least at the uh, practical, general surgical level, must be practically focused. Can you take this message to your practice? And in that regard, what here is one typical paper that might for all of us might find useful. And what this paper says is simply that uh, when you look at it, it is saying that antibiotic therapy for uh, prevention of fistula and ano after incision and drainage of a simple perianal abscess. I mean, it's a common topic. It's something that all of us should be easily interested in. So first thing we always do whenever we, uh, I said whenever we look at the uh, topic is we look at the heading. Okay, we analyze and look at the heading because to give us an idea about whether we want to go into this matter or not. And then what I also told you in the last thing was the first thing that you must do is this. Okay, don't look at the abstract. Reading the abstract will give you false ideas and especially don't go first and look at this, the conclusion part. It will do what is called a confirmation bias. It will tend to make you more prejudiced rather than less knowledgeable. And what we also said that you need to do is that instead of that, read the introductory paragraphs. And when you read the introductory paragraphs, as we should see here in this paper, uh, what uh, really what we're interested in is uh, just this. And that is, it says here is the most common operative approach to perianal abscess is incision and drainage. But there is a common problem when dealing with abscess in the anal area is the risk of recurrence at about seven weeks, okay? So as I said, when you are reading the introductory paragraphs, you are fundamentally trying to answer three questions. What is known, what is not known, and what needs to be known? So we have answered, we found out the first one here, and that is what is known is that recurrence after IND of a fistula and I know is a very common problem, as we all know, time and time again in our own practice. Reading further down, what you also see here is that there is no definite guideline mandating the use of antibiotics after IND. And it is said that it is used is only indicated in special conditions like you know, a specific situation not getting into. So that is what we don't know. What we don't know is, can we use antibiotics? And how, if so, what is the answer? And he also states that almost all studies that have been conducted up to this date have been in uncontrolled conditions, small populations, and in the context of retrospective studies. In other words, none of these are scientific uh, uh, arguments or scientific uh, papers. So this is how what we don't know, right? What we know is to recapitulate that there is a high degree of recurrence of the fistula and ano. What we don't know is that whether there is a place for antibiotic treatment because the evidence as it exists right now is not scientific. And what is concluding by saying is that we evaluated the role of post-operative antibiotics in the prevention of fistula and ano after IND of perianal absence. This is what we need to know. Right, and as I said, rather than reading the abstract, if you just went through these three paragraphs, you have a substantial idea about the present state of knowledge of fistula and ano. 
and uh, you know even if you didn't do anything except read the first paragraph and then move along you will end up being uh, so much smarter and wiser okay so the next thing we saw is that after we finish this then we need to ask ourselves an important question give me a second and that is this trial that we are seeing what kind of a study is it and we said that studies can be of two major types one they can be interventional or they can be observational depending on whether you are doing something or just observing and a subgroup of the observational studies in fact when i described it last time i called it a separate group it's not a subgroup of observation studies is studies that are looking at the efficacy of diagnostic tests which essentially are still only observation studies but with a specific focus on two issues that we call sensitivity and specificity now looking at the title therefore this is a interventional study you are proposing an intervention and the intervention be the use of an antibiotic so that that is the second thing that we said we must uh, know from there and then we said that from there what we need to do is those three questions what we know what we don't know and what we need to know okay so we have come that far in all of this now once you have done that the next thing that you need to do and incidentally i i am doing this kind of blackboard teaching largely as a tribute to the greatest blackboard teacher of all time that i have ever known most of you probably are too young but when we did our anatomy way in the 1970s there was one formidable teacher professor of uh, professor and head of the anatomy department by the name of dr cooper dr cooper was a 6 foot 3 well made tall hefty parsi who was just absolutely terrified us but also was easily the most brilliant teacher that i have ever seen in my life and what he could do with a blackboard now we talk about computer graphics and cgi and all that kind of nonsense with just color chalk and a blackboard this man could do 3d reconstructions it was absolutely amazing and i think that as a small tribute to dr cooper i'm also doing a little blackboard teaching today although i will switch over to slides a little later so we answered those three questions what we know what we don't know and what we need to know as far as this is concerned and then after you're done with after you're done with that what you then need to do is to establish these four things the population of the study the indicator variable the, the uh, comparison and the outcome right the population of the study is those who had an ind for a perianal abscess the indicator variable is an antibiotic the control variable is no treatment and the outcome variable is recurrence okay so you need to keep that get that in your mind this is what we are looking at because this forms the crux of study of the study now once you have done with that that what now all studies will do including this is it will try and compare this with this and then what it will say is that the outcome that we are interested in recurrence is better or worse in one or the other in other words it will show that there is a difference between the two outcomes a difference or a delta okay now this is the crux and i said in the last time's class that if you were to reduce the essence of all medical publications you can do it in one sentence by saying that all medical publications are directed towards showing differences and proving that these differences are valid okay so now the difference we are trying to say is that antibiotic therapy uh, has a benefit on recurrence after the fistula in ano that clarity is there but then we said that even if you show that there is a difference one cannot assume that this difference is significant there is a huge question on the excuse my writing huh? i'm not it's on an ip now 
kind of got the screen all angled in a crazy way. So it's uh, okay. So the main thing is, if there is a difference, we cannot assume that this difference is significant. And it's up to us. It's up to us to prove that there is validity. That is to prove that this significant is valid. Okay. And we also said the reason for this concern can be uh, because of two reasons. One is what is called systematic error. And the other what is called random error. OK? These are the two things. Now, random error is something that a biostatistician will calculate, and we are not interested in it. What we are primarily looking at is systematic error. And that's going to be the thrust of today's talk is that how do you look for or try to eliminate systematic error when you're looking at a study to decide whether there is enough room for uh, validity or not. And that's what we shall. This systematic error essentially is a reflection of study design. Okay. And that's what we should look at today. Fairly simple concepts on study design which will give you a better idea whether it's a good study or not. And then we, before we exit, uh, we will briefly talk about what is the p-value. Don't worry, no match, no statistics, no nothing, but just a very good idea of how you can use the, uh, the p-value to let you know whether this difference is uh, accurate or not. Now, using the p-value alone is not good enough, because the p-value is just a number. What matters? before you even uh, decide to look at the p-value is to see whether this study, the systematic error was minimized and to see how the study was designed. So that's going to be the thrust of uh, today's, uh, uh, you know, today's lecture. So that's basically what we covered. And this is what we covered last time around, okay? Uh, we looked at all of this. So let me now quickly switch sides. Okay. We said that all trials in clinical, in clinical uh, at least as far as clinicians are concerned, are comparative trials. We are trying to compare A with B, and what we are always doing to quickly recapitulate is we are using an indicator variable A that gives us a certain outcome, and comparing it with a control which has an indicator B, which could be either nothing or it could be some existing treatment, uh, and comparing the two outcomes. And we are now trying to say that there is a difference between A and B. As we already said, this difference can be due to, uh, you know, and we have to make sure that this is a genuine difference and this does not occur because of a comparison error. That is, in other words, we are comparing apples with apples and not apples with oranges. And that's what we, how do you achieve this? In any critical, in any clinical trial, you have to ask yourself two critical questions. One is, is there a comparison at all? Is there a study versus a control? Because if there is no comparison, if the whole thing is only a thing, then it's a story. It's not science. It's like reading a story. And you, as far as the science of it is concerned, there is no science at all. In, in today's publishing, unless there is a valid control, there is no science in what you're doing. So your first question is, is there a control? Has the author bothered to compare what he is trying to do with what was there earlier? And that's the first step. Now, if there is a control, then you have to ask yourself, how was the study done? Was it done in a prospective fashion? That is, you started at a point and moved ahead and gathered data, or was it retrospective? That is, you went back and looked at the data that you already have. And right here itself, you know which one is more powerful. And if it was prospective, were you carrying out an observational study or an interventional study? The two kinds that we already saw. Now, if you were doing it prospectively 
and it was an observational study, you need to do something called a cohort. A cohort is just a word which means a group of people that are starting out on an experience at the same time with the assumption that none, nobody in this group has the indicator variable. The classic example of a prospective observational trial would be your Framingham trial, which is now into its third 40 or 50th year, and it was started with a population in a part of America where they started with a population and then followed it forward looking for risks for vascular disease. So that's a cohort. Like that, you can have any number of cohorts, but the ideal scientific prospective observational study has to be a cohort because cohorts start with the advantage that at the point of starting, nobody had the disease. Uh, as similarly, if you're doing a prospective interventional study, like we saw here, that is after an IND, giving antibiotics to prevent recurrence, that the ideal method of doing it is what's called a randomized controlled trial, and we'll come look at it a little bit more, okay? Now, if the study is retrospective, they are inherently weaker, uh, largely because the hypothesis was not made a priori or ahead of time. The hypothesis for the study was made after the act was done. And this is something will become obvious as we look more and more into this problem. And when you're looking at retrospective studies, there are two kinds, and we will briefly see each of those, what's called case control series and case series. Now, when it comes to a question of the other questions, the one question was, is there a comparison? Are you doing study versus control? And the other important question is, is the comparison fair? And that's what we've been talking about all along, apples versus apples, not apples versus oranges. And that the fairness of the comparison, we will look at as we go along, okay? Now, in terms of assuring comparable groups, in an interventional study, the gold standard today is the randomized controlled trial. And they have the ones, and in fact, your Cochrane collaboration, the Cochrane database, is the world's largest accumulation of interventional trials, randomized controlled trials, and that's the reason why the Cochrane database is so powerful is at the word go, it takes in only RCTs and then decides about the validity. It eliminates all the other less scientific ones, okay? And the way you do a randomized controlled trial is very simple. You start with a population, the P that we talked about, and then you apply to the population inclusion and exclusion criteria. And then what will then happen is you will get the intended population. That is from them, you would have taken out ones that you intend to do the study on. And at this point in time, this is the crux of a randomized control trial. And this is the reason why so many of us have problems with randomized control trial is that the decision to allocate the patients into a treatment arm or a control arm must be done on a strictly random fashion. You cannot use what is called your clinical judgment. All kinds of emotional factors cannot be brought in which also brings us to the problem of ethics in randomized control trial. We probably could talk about it right at the end, but you have to randomly allocate your patients in, for the intervention into either being the control. In this study that we saw, the ones who did not receive anything, or the study group, the ones who got the antibiotics. Both groups are followed up to observe the outcome, and then you tell us whether there is a this or isn't a difference, and this will then be submitted to a statistical analysis for random variability, okay? So this is the gold standard. This is the RCT and quite obviously difficult to do, okay? But today's terms, if you're saying science in any intervention, a randomized control trial is the uh, gold standard. Random allocation is the key word. Now, there are many situations where you may not be able to do an RCT. One, the disease could be rare or it could be that the time frame that you're talking about could be large. So in which case, if you don't do an RCT or can't do an RCT, the alternate option for you is what's called a case control trial. And a case control trial is again starts with a population, an accessible population. And from this population, once again, you do the same thing, I put in your inclusion and exclusion criteria, you get an intended population, you take the intended population as a study group and you judge the outcome. Now for the control group, 
what you have to do is go to your medical record section and from there for every patient in the study group you must get either a one to one it could be two to one one to one three to one depending on how powerful you want your study to be you have to get matches that are identical to their patients on the study group with the exception for the indicator variable that is here if you had a certain uh, 28 year old who was you know a non smoker non diabetic who had the antibiotic you must go into your records and find a 28 year old uh, who did not have you know, of a similar matching nature who did not have an antibiotic and that obviously tells you how hard uh, case control trials are going to be once you do that and once you get your case controls that is used as a control group and the outcome is again judged to see whether there is or isn't a difference case control trials are extremely hard the reason obvious reason being one you need to have a very high quality medical records you require a lot of effort to be able to go back and match them and case control trials by and large are more applicable for observational studies than for interventional studies the one that we do all the time and is the easiest of all to do is what's called a retrospective or a historical control where you go through the same process you get an intended population you put it through a study and to the study group and you get an outcome but for the comparison what you do is you just go into your medical records you pull out an unmatched series you don't bother matching you just for the same period of time you get all patients who had something else done you use them as a control group and then once again uh try and see whether there is a difference now with rare exceptions historical retrospective case control may studies would not be considered as will not be considered as scientific evidence and uh, most publications today won't even accept it and this is the reason why we keep complaining saying that indian quality of indian publication is so poor because the majority of studies uh, are are on retrospective uh, historical controls and they they are not considered valid because the entire uh, process of comparison is made after the fact uh, and uh, you know and then it's just uh, very we not if you look at the evidence pyramid these kind of case controls are um, these kind of controls are considered very very poor evidence and this is also the reason why we complain saying that i sent this case series with 1600 patients but they rejected it it's not the 1600 that matters if you had even sent 160 but properly done randomized trial they would have been happy to look at it but the sheer number alone especially if it's a retrospective uh, comparison is not considered valid it's not considered to be good science the other aspect that we saw about the second critical question is is this comparison fair has this been made properly and the reason you have to do this is your groups that you're comparing they must not be what are called confounders i'll show you an example we'll go into that a little bit later a confounding variable is the presence of some element in one group or the other that could be responsible for the outcome rather than the indicator variable and uh, is best shown by means of an example in here this was the study that we saw last week the one with the used antibiotic prophylaxis uh for at the time of catheter removal to prevent urinary tract infections and here when you look at the two patient characteristics of those with and those without prophylaxis if you look at them in all major aspects uh you will find that none of the we'll come back to p values a little bit later but for the time being you take it from me that none of these p values are what are considered significant so what it means is the two groups are well matched now when you talk about confounding variables suppose in the instance that we had one group which was just which was with the one group was 67 years the one other group was 83 years so the outcome might be a result of the age difference rather than your antibiotic so age becomes a confounding variable same way you can go down the list like if one group had more asa fives than the other that could have been the cause of the outcome and maybe not your antibiotic diabetes anything so the purpose behind a randomization is essentially it's the only technique that we know today that ensures at least to some extent that you will get comparable groups this concept is extremely important the reason for randomization is to ensure comparable groups 
And the reason you want comparable groups is you go on to be able to eliminate confounding factors. That if there is a difference, that difference is only because of what you did, which was you gave the antibiotic, and not because of other confounders like age, sex, diabetes, and so on. The concept is simple. But the point is, to be able to get there, you need to apply it with a certain rigidity. Again, another similar thing where another study where uh, they look at a variety of things. This had to do with uh, two types of IV catheters, one which was removed only if indicated and the others which are removed on a protocol. And they showed that, you know, there was no difference between the two. But here again, when you look at the groups, you'll find that in terms of comorbidities, wound infection, type of admission, age, none of the differences are significant. So there are no confounding variables, okay? So that, that's a very important concept that you have to remember is that when you're comparing, the two groups have to have no confounding variables. And as we know today, the only way that you can ensure that is either in a randomized prospective trial or a very well done case control or a cohort. In a cohort where you start where you assume that the mixture will be even, okay? So that, that's one concept that we look at in terms of this comparison between apples and oranges, okay? Now we'll move to the next one and that is uh, this was the imp indicator comparison and properly speaking, maybe this should have come before. And this is, we talk about the P of the PICO. What we just talked about was the I, C, and O. How do you look at the indicator variable, the comparison variable, and the outcome variable, and make sure that at least systemic, systematically, the two groups were easily comparable, okay? That part is clear. Now, the earlier on than that, before you start the trial event, you have to sample. You have to have a population that you need to get to the P. And here there are some concepts in the population that you need to understand, which can induce what is called sampling error. Because fundamentally, if your population itself is uh, impure to begin with, then it doesn't matter what conclusion you made, because ultimately the results, the variability can be due to uh, that. So when you're sampling a population, what we have to, uh, one second. Somebody's asked a note. How do I get that, Dave? Uh, no, sir, please carry no. on this. Nobody. But I said I didn't get a concept. I can, I can answer that, but all if they can hold on to it, we'll come back to the end. Okay, sir, sure. Uh, no, or if they want to raise it now, I can wait. Do we know who said that or uh, any idea at all, Pranakshna? Uh, Sir, I can't make out. Uh, they'll come back again if needed. Okay, we'll come back in the end, then I'll move along. Because, oh, sure. uh, so, we're talking now about the P of the PICU, and that is the population. And this, if you don't pick the population well, you will get what's called a sampling error. And a sampling error, quite simply, arises from the fact that you have to, for the decent of the study, uh, that you can do sampling in only one of two ways. You can do what's called a random sampling, where if you have a whole group of people, you can pick them at random and best ensure that you're getting an even selection. But random sampling just won't work in clinical trials at all. You can do random sampling. Essentially, it's only an epidemiological study. There is no way that you can apply random samples in interventional or clinical trials. So what we are left with, therefore, is what's called non-random samples. So fundamentally, uh, that is an inherent problem with all sampling in clinical studies is it's a non-random sample but you have to live with it because there's nothing else you can do about it but it may have been sometimes to be a source of error now when you look at the process of sampling the value chain in the non-random sampling itself comes down for every method by which you do it and that's easy to understand again when you do a non-random sample the best way to do it is a consecutive sampling. That is, you take all patients who are available. You don't reject anybody on any account. The next is one which we use a lot because of convenience is what's called convenience sampling. And this is taking patients who are easily available. A typical example might be that uh, your admitting day might be on a given day. And for the study, you're taking patients who came in on your admitting day, but you're taking everybody. In a way, 
it's an improper sample because it's a convenient sample because you don't know for sure that the kind of patients who come to you on your admitting day will be any different from those on the other day. And in fact, there's a funny story here that I should probably share about how convenient sampling can be. So we had, when we were doing our uh, training, we had one uh, surgical chief who was particularly, I don't know, I hope I'm not quoted on this anyway, the man has gone, who was, terrible, who was absolutely terrible. Terrible as a human being, terrible as a surgeon, terrible every single way. And his admitting day used to be on, I don't know, some Monday or Thursday, some day. But what would happen is all the ward boys, attenders, and all those people who were out there, patients came in. Patients, you know, in those days, GH patients were absolutely a punch who had no choices. They would come in and the guys would say, don't come today. Uh, you won't get treatment. Go away. So if that man did a study, <laughs> all his patients are essentially going to be uh, not well selected. So, so a convenient sampling, although it could be convenient, is not uh, a good value, good way to do it when it's very lower on the uh, chain. And the third kind of sampling that should be avoided at all times is judgmental sampling, where you decide who comes into the study. So obviously, right then and there, it will induce a bias. The reason why you pick them into the study would depend on a lot of uh, things that uh, you know, cannot be easily controlled. Okay, I'm sorry. Just trying to get rid of a red ant only. I'm sitting in a place where there's a huge population of fire ants. <laughs> anyway, got it off. Don't worry, I'm here. Uh, so there are points of errors in the sampling process. And the first thing is, ideally, you would like to sample the entire population that is available. So that's just possible. It's not possible or feasible. So what you then decide is you select on a group that you can reach. And from this group, you do what's called a process of recruitment. The first thing you do is, who are we going to bring into the study? And this you usually do on the basis of inclusion and exclusion criteria. You may take all patients who had an IND for an abscess, but you may exclude those who are diabetic, those who are elderly, those who are immunosuppressed, those who had cancer treatment, all that kind of stuff. So this is in a sampling, and each one of these inclusions and exclusions can induce a bias. How did you do the sampling? We saw that, is it a? Consecutive sample, is it, a random, is, it a, is it a judgmental sample, is it a convenient sample, that makes an impact on the sample. Where did you do the sampling is also important. We already saw that when you're comparing a public hospital versus a private hospital, obviously the populations will be different and that could be the confounder. The reason why you got a difference in the results could have well been a result of the fact that where you did the uh, study. And then also important is when did you do the study? And this could be important in trials that are carried out over long periods of time because as you know, things change. And during the course of the study itself, there might have been things which, uh, there might have been issues which made the, uh, you know, which affected the treatment and the outcome. So the when also is important. Was this a study done over a reasonable time frame? All of that will then give you what is called the intended population. And right here, there's a very, very important thing that you must look at, and that is if the dropout rate between the point of enrollment or recruitment and the point of exit from the study, that is when the study was closed, if more than 15% of the patients dropped out, that is, they received the treatment but didn't come through for follow-up or left halfway or refused to get treated, that kind of stuff, if the dropout rate between enrollment and exit in a study is greater than 15%, this study is automatically invalid because that amount is too large and you don't know what really happened to them. As a matter of fact, generally patients that drop out of studies because they are not happy with their treatment. It's like all of us saying, you know, I don't see incisional hernia recurrences largely because your recurrences won't come back to you. It will only go to somebody else. And by the same token, that somebody else will only be seeing others' recurrences, and he'll say, well, you know, so uh, in that way, it is dropouts of more than a large number of dropouts, between 12 to 15 percent in the study, invalidates the study. And that's, again, another important thing you must look, look for in terms of the population. And here is, I'm just showing you a, a simple study because it, 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 it's a very nice uh, uh, 
uh, example of how uh, populations, and this is the study where they use tranexamic acid for heavy menstrual bleeding. It could just as well be anything else, something else for GI bleeding, so on and so forth, where they screened 711 patients. They put in the, took away 515, and what was then left for randomization was 196. And at the end of the trial, they were able to, uh, the number which withdrew was 29 in this group, 19 in this group. Uh, and so that it, it is, uh, you know, it's a little troublesome, but they, you know, but they've given you everything. Here is a study that clearly states uh, what the patients were and, you know, and this is what's called a CONSORT diagram, which stands for uh, Consolidated Standards on Reporting Trials. And this should be a part of any good trial that you are uh, talking about. Okay, I mean, I'll just we'll quickly skip to that. We don't need it. 123, 73 enrolled, and at the exit time was 115 versus 72. So the dropouts are uh, not all that bad, and this is a good study, all right? Here again, another simple thing where they uh, use fenfibrate in diabetic patients to see whether they could uh, eliminate uh, uh, eliminate amputations or at least minimize amputations. 13,000 patients screened, 4,000 were uh, rejected for criteria, 9,000 something randomized, 4,000 to fenfibrate, 4,900 to placebo, and 4895 for 900. So the follow-up. These are the kind of studies where follow-up is uh, is very is very good. Now there, uh, there is one small element here that you might want to notice. That might, if it's too much for you, don't worry about it. But that is, the patients who are lost to follow up, 12 and 10, this group is kept as part of the, as is considered as failures of treatment of that particular group. And that is then this kind of a study where the patients who are lost were not removed from the analysis, but were kept in the analysis and considered as failures of that particular group is what's known as an intention to treat analysis. Okay. Lastly, there is again a concept that I think is worth remembering, and that is ahead of time, even before you start a study, you can determine what's called a sample size. You, you need to, you, can, you know, when we're talking about trials, you always worry, how many patients should I see? How many should I recruit? And this can be again done by a very simple statistical method that you need to do it, a statistician can do it for you. And what they will do is that based, if you are talking about an anticipated difference of so much with significance levels, don't even worry about what all, all that is, they will tell you that you need 220 patients to be able to get significant uh, 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 values. And this is again very important when you're talking about the population, because a lot of times studies will be considered underpowered. In other words, not enough numbers to show whether there's a real difference. So the underpowering of studies can be eliminated by doing an a priori sample size calculation. And by the same way, if you do too many patients, you're wasting resources. And so this is, again, something you will find in a lot of good randomized trials is ahead of time, determining the sample size co co comparison. And then when you reach that point, you stop and see whether you have the difference that you're expecting. So this is a very, very, very powerful method of telling the world that you're doing the right thing, okay? So we talked about systematic errors in the uh, population. We talked about how you can sample, how the what, when, where, how of sampling can induce uh, errors in every step of the way, and the various kinds of sampling and you know all, all those things. We talked about also systematic errors in terms of comparison and why it is so important to either do a prospective cohort or to do a randomized controlled trial in interventions if you're trying to uh, make, a, make a difference, okay? All right. Another quick look at this. Uh, besides all of this also, since uh, so much of clinical trials involves humans. Humans have to be involved in the process. And humans, as you know, are not reproducible in terms of the quality of what they do. So many trials, you might also want to look at things like this, whether they are present, whether the trials have written out clear protocols, whether those who were in, involved in the trial had training of some sort. 
and this could be important in things like laparoscopic comparisons where you have to ensure that skills were valid and if not you have to do what's called skill stratification blinding of observations could be very important especially when you're looking at things where there is a lot of subjective error if you ask surgeons to look at wound infections they will always say it's not a wound infection they won't admit it if you ask non surgeons to look at wound infections you'll get a different result and ultimately the exact way of doing it would be microbiological so uh, are you blinding uh, you know all these things we will keep it in the back of your mind that there are besides the two factors that we talked about there are also other factors that can induce error in the design don't get worried about it right now as and when when we see papers i will show you how we will see whether any of these could be looked at but that's also an important element to keep in mind okay then uh okay now we said that the purpose of whatever we're trying to do is to show differences and we said that the role of the clinician is to make sure that there are no systematic errors and we talked about all that the way you do the population the way you conduct the study etc cetera, etc cetera. now when it comes to a question of what is called random errors that is can this be just due to random factors that's when the biostatistician has to take your numbers he'll put it through a whole variety of things let's not even worry about all those tests at all today we're not going to worry about that but ultimately what you do need to be able to interpret is something called the p value the p value is just a measure that tells you how strong the differences are whether it's a strong difference a weak difference or something like that and don't worry about it no maths at all i'm not going to get into anything i'm just going to give you a quick and easy way of how to, of understanding how to interpret p value and we already saw that you know you know with this by now this is a Uh, I, I'll keep on repeating this literally because this is what it's all about: uh, an intervention, a comparison, an outcome, and a validity. Okay. Now, is this due to real or chance? Is a question, and we already said that systematic error is what we looked at. It is our responsibility. It precedes statistical analysis. After which, the random error factor, which arises from the natural variability of populations. the biostatistician will do for you but he cannot compensate for poor design if your study design is poor he'll only give you a p value that may or may not be the truth okay so we have to the responsibility is predominantly ours now there are two keys to understanding biostatistics and fundamentally just think of all your biostatistic biostatistical mumbo jumbo taking place in what's called a black box again the analogy that i will try and give you is a mobile phone your mobile phone is essentially a black box to you you have absolutely no idea of what is happening inside it totally i mean you but you ask me now but whatever you need to do with it an input and an output you know how to handle that and that's all you worry about the same way what you do is as a clinician you get all your data together and you give it to the biostatistician who will put it into a biostatistical and do a biostatistical mumbo jumbo all the tests that you're not worried about and it'll give you two estimates of chance that is two estimates of the difference being due to chance one is called the p value and the other one then is called what's called the 95% confidence interval now the 95% ci is actually a much more accurate and precise representation of the difference we won't talk about it today it's a little difficult concept in terms of not difficult to understand but has to be closely followed and i will take it separately when we're looking at papers uh, and indeed today most papers will give you 95% ci is more than they will give you p value but p value still continue to be valid for uh, whatever we're looking at and what is this p value this p value is essentially a measure of the validity of the difference and the p value will usually be given as a decimal a p value a biostatistically significant p value that is when it what that is a value that says that the differences are real has to be less than this critical figure of uh, 0.05 that is in other words 5% in other words less than 5% chance that the differences are not real or 95% chance it is true 
in all of the statistics you will find that day we saw what is called rejecting the null hypothesis uh, so same way you are a 5% chance says there's only a 5% chance of it not being true they are being very careful they are not saying it is a 95% chance of it being true it's a 5% chance of it not being true and similarly like that if they say the p value is 0.001 that means it is a highly significant difference because there's only a 1 in 1000 chance that the differences are not real and, and, and the more zeros after the decimal that much more the strength okay in general p values of less than 0.5 are considered significant less than 0.1 are considered uh, highly significant I mean, are considered very significant and anything beyond it is highly significant especially if it goes on to the one in a thousand chance and here is an example if they say the p value is 0.34 This is a non-significant difference because there is a 34% chance that the differences are due to uh, pure uh, uh, are not real and are not significant. Okay. Now the question arises: Are there any drawbacks about the p-value? And yes, there are very many. It's basically a qualitative thing. It's just an on-off binary state. Uh, the nature of the, the of the decision is very dichotomous. Why? Why? Why zero five? Why couldn't it be one? Or why can't it be ten? And this is because from trial and error, biostatisticians have found that this is a convenient sweet spot. It also raises the issue of if a p-value of 0.049 is significant, but a p-value of 0.051, which is only two small places away, as being non-significant, is a very arbitrary decision. Okay. and even today there is a lot of criticism about test saying that a p value of 0.05 is probably too wide and there is several people who have said that if you redo all your studies statistically and use a a value of 0.01 that is in other words only a 1% chance of error you will find that the vast majority of clinical trials will become non significant everything that we take for graph for as value will become quickly non significant there's a lot of things going on about it but for the time being let's assume that we are going to take p value of less than 0.05 as the significant point for statistical cut off uh, these things size of difference direction of difference and all that will be more clear when we talk about 95% confidence intervals and you know and there's no you know it's a very take it or leave it kind of situation in p values but with that as it may you and i are not going to be by statisticians we are just going to be able to see yes there is a difference i think it's a good difference because the study was done well i want to know whether it is statistically valid if the figure is less than 0.05 it's valid and the smaller it is beyond 0.05 the more valid it is just remember that and i think you will be uh, home free as you far as this is concerned now we'll move to probably what's going to be the last thing that we will discuss for today before i show you a little outline and that is uh we we keep saying we have been saying that difference 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 and you have to demonstrate validity of a difference okay we did all that i've got a difference i know the difference is valid how do i apply it in my clinical practice give me some kind of a factor by which i can understand and this is where particularly in interventional trials the calc simple calculation of a number known as an nnp uh it's a number called the number needed to treat it can also be used as numbers needed to harm in case the outcomes are more harmful but calculation of what called an nnp will give you a better idea of well how well or how easily you can apply this in your own practice okay now let's look at a situation here where in the in the, in the indicator the outcome was 4.3% and in the control the outcome was 14.4% so there's about a 10% difference between a and b let's assume that it's done the tested and this value is significant the what we need now is an absolute risk reduction rate and that is here the difference between the two outcomes and that is 10.1% now from this reduction rate you can now calculate what is called the number needed to treat which is the reciprocal that is the 1 by the arr here the arr was 10% which is 10 by 100 so the number needed to treat is 1 by 10 by 100 that is 100 by 10 that is 10 okay so very simple calculation you take your differences 
invert it and you and you do the division you get a number now what does this mean what this means is that 10 individuals have to be treated for the new intervention for one to benefit and that's an easy way for us to understand now you can tell me whether you want to apply it in your clinical practice or not now if it is something as simple as a simple antibiotic before pulling the catheter that's a significant benefit and not only that it's something that is going to be easy cheap and easy to do whereas on the other hand if you're talking about a complex surgical procedure that only uh, uh, only very highly technically trained people can do or using a technology that is very very expensive then an nnt of 10 may be too much the same nnt may be too much but what it allows you to do is that when you calculate the number needed to treat from the differences it gives you a handle by which you can decide whether you can apply this in your clinical practice or not the smaller the nnt the more a reason there is for you to apply like suppose i say the nnt is only 3 so that's a great treatment for every three patients one patient will benefit but if i say the nnt is going to be 87 you will have to treat 87 patients to be able to get one benefit uh, so that that this is an important number and unfortunately most studies won't give you this number i don't know why very rarely will they calculate the nnt because i you know it's a very valuable thing and this is what i always apply at the end of a study when i see or I'm, when I'm convinced that there is a difference, I ask myself the question, what is the NNT or the numbers needed to have, okay? So just a simple calculation, like here, for instance, here is uh, the same urinary tract. Uh, let's look at this. This is interesting because this is that urinary tract uh, infection rate where what we looked at was significant uh, symptom, symptomatic urinary tract infection. Uh, uh, oh, one second, is this the one or? Yeah, yeah, right. Here's the one. That is after the catheter removal, in those who got prophylaxis, 5%. In those who did not get prophylaxis, it was 21%. So the difference is 15%, right? So the NNT here will become 1 by 15 by 100. That is 100 by 15, which is approximately 6 people. And that's an excellent NNT, that for every six people, you're going to get one or well, every three, you know, one benefit. On the other hand, you turn it the other way around. If you did not treat, one in six persons are going to get urinary tract infection. And that, that is a significant burden. A UTI, you know, is, a, uh, is an important issue. But fundamentally, what, what, what we would like to do is that once you think that the study is important, look at the basic uh, outcome that you were talking about. Look at the difference, calculate an NNT, and then ask yourself, is it worth it? NNT of six is a very small number, especially when you're talking about something as simple as giving an antibiotic for a urinary tract infection. Now forget that this is also something similar, but we will. Okay. So I think that that will pretty much cover, and I think we've taken you now through the whole uh, breadth of how you can look at a paper. And uh, I'll show you that, it's, and I'll quickly show you the way I use a template uh, by which you can use all these things that we talked about to be able to take a paper and put it into a, a grid so that you can understand. And this is, none of these concepts are difficult. I, I, so far, I have, you know, I taught you everything without any real serious math other than what you know in your fourth standard. But understand just concepts. And none, all of these are concepts like clinicians. Now, again, remember, what we have looked at in the last two sessions is only the ABC. I've taught you the ABC. You want to be Shakespeare? You've got to do a lot of work. In other words, you have to keep on reading, reading. We don't want to be Shakespeare's. We just want to be able to read and write with a certain level of proficiency, for which I think the knowledge that we have had or shared with you so far is more than ample. Now, just hang on with me a second, and I'll show you how all that we have learned can be put into a template of some sort. So that you can then uh, now that something looks the same thing that we talked about antibiotic therapy for prevention of fistula you know after incision and drainage so we said that the first step we will start is this we know we don't know we need to know okay those three boxes then the population was the who what why what adults 
Uh, I have not put down the what, who, and all that, but that basically that it is. The who is adults undergoing IND or perianal lapses, first episode with more chronic illness. The what is one dose of ceftriaxone. And, you know, and here, uh, this was a, the, the study was all done in one shot, so there's no when. The where is was all done in a teaching hospital. And here, as you can see, they used this a priori sample size of 150 in each arm. So the study was also, that way, was scientifically very valid. Uh, the, the indicator group, we, we went to the study, the indicator group had metronidazole for 500 milligrams eight hourly and ciprofloxacin 500 milligrams 12 hourly orally for seven days. The control group had no antibiotics. And here are the critical number, 156, 150, the number which completed the study was 155, 144. So your dropout rate is fairly small. And comparability, when you looked at the study, you will find that in terms of confounders that we talked about, age, sex, comorbidity, anesthetic type, et cetera, et cetera, we find that the comparability was excellent. But the crux of the matter is that when you looked at this study, the one on the right-hand side over here, and you find that when you compare, the antibiotic versus no antibiotic group. The antibiotic group had a 14.2% recurrence rate as opposed to a 31% recurrence rate. And this value was highly significant at a p-value of 0 0.001. That is less than one in a thousand chance that the difference is due to random factors and not real. Now you calculate out the NNT in this, that's again quite simple, 14 to 32, let's say approximately, uh, 17. So if you calculate the NNT, it is 1 by 17 percent, 100 by 17, again about five patients, five to six patients. So you need to treat only small numbers to be able to uh, see, you know, to be able to produce significant differences. It's a good paper because it's a prospective randomized controlled trial. We already said that's the best way of doing it. And, you know, it's a very, it's a good study. And this is, and then ask yourself the question, can you apply it in your practice? The answer is yes. It's simple, it's a disease that you see all the time. The intervention is talking about as a simple, safe intervention. And here there is scientific validity, highly significant difference with an NNT that is very, very acceptable. So I'm not teaching or talking to you something about which can't be done or it is something academic. How can it be more practical than this? Tell me. It can't be, right? So that's what, that's what I've been, for the last 40 years, I've been trying to say, teach is that evidence-based medicine is not a luxury, it's a responsibility. It's something that you owe when you're recommending or doing something to a patient. Uh, uh, can, well, one second, Alexa, can we go back online? I think I'm done. Yeah, yeah, sure, sir. Okay, there you go. Uh, I'm, I'm back on, right? So, Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So that, that's where I think we have now more or less uh, uh, you know, uh, completed the whole academic exercise part of it. In the sense that I walked you through the whole process. It's a simple process, easy to understand. And what I will do is that what uh, uh, we'll try and see whether I can share some more. Let me see how I can take this forward now. I think maybe with Alakish and I can sit and discuss about how we can make something like a journal club out of this. So this can't be a theoretical exercise. I've showed you practically that it's not a theoretical exercise. It's an exercise that you can use in your daily practice, and it's not hard. At the end of the day, all you learn to learn that chart that I do, I do it because I have no other work. I sit and draw all those designs. It needn't be that complicated. It can just be a tablet column, a simple sheet of paper with all those boxes. When you read a paper, just enter those boxes as you go along. And pretty soon you'll get to be a very, very efficient editor. You'll know how to look at articles. Okay. So, saying that kind of skills. Uh, and I was, little, I was thinking also about, you know, often I said that maybe some retrospection because I have done 45 years of this particular game. And what are some of my thoughts on it? And I was just thinking this morning, it's got nothing to do with what we talked about, it's just the way surgery is heading. When I started my surgical training in 1975, that was a time when, as a surgeon, you were told there were only two things that were really, really, really important. One was technical skills, and the other one was anatomical knowledge. You needed to have both. The best surgeons were those who had the best technical skills combined with the best anatomical knowledge. And to remind you, uh, 75 was the era when we had no CT scans, 
no ultrasound. The most sophisticated test was an op was a barium contrast study, which today you guys probably don't even see anymore. And uh, that was the era in which you were told, and the guys I worked with, the ones who impressed us most were the people who could do this. My my own chief, uh, this was you know this man's uh, understanding of human anatomy. He was technically superb. Never seen anybody who could operate like that. But his point was that he could approach a complicated or, or, or situation. And regardless of where he was going, at every point in time, he knew where he was anatomically. He knew it with a precision that was absolutely astounding. And that was a gift. Now, the point is, neither of these things are valid anymore. You know, and that's what, for a long time, I held on to the conclusion, no saying, no, 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 it's not right. But in all honesty, if you look at it now, the technical competence that you need is something completely different. Everything is being done through laparoscopes and robotics. So you don't really need, and, and whenever I see the capability of robotics, it is amazing the kind of arm twisting and flexing and suturing in remote areas and all that. You can't do it with your hand. Robotics are actually probably technically better off than the human hand. And, you know, and laparoscopic surgery is again something that we, whenever when we were growing, we were taught about something called a pain <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, carry on, sir. Carry on with some disciplines. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. The thing was that, uh, you know, technical surgery uh, was something extremely important, and we needed to have what was called a field for tissue, where they said that you know, there was a very subjective variable called a field for tissue. And when you worked with people, you knew some people had a field for tissue. They were gentle. Some people were very rough with tissue. They could not sense tissue. That again doesn't seem to be valid in the laparoscopic era. How do you teach field for tissue? Or if you do, it's a completely different thing. It's not a direct field. It is a tactile sensation that you have to get through an instrument. So all those things have changed now. And I think that uh, I, I see surgery in evolution over the last 45 years, and it's not the same as what I entered. Absolutely not the same as what I entered. And anatomic knowledge, again, today, with the way you can uh, image and section the human body, it's, just, uh, it's amazing. question arises whether you really don't need anatomic knowledge. You can you know, the way, but you do need some atomic knowledge, but uh, the human anatomy can be demonstrated in ways that were it. And in fact, there are specialities like neurosurgery, where you can do a complete simulation of the operation before you actually even touch the patient. You can look at the, take all their MRs, their angiograms and everything together, and you can do a complete simulated approach. Because they are also using so much by way of robotics and other instruments, you can do a completely simulated approach for that given patient. Not for any X, Y, Z, for that given patient, so that when you operate, you can be precise about where you go. And it, it is, surgery is not the same as what I entered it. It's completely different. And frankly, I don't have the skills to be a surgeon today. Uh, I, you know, I kind of, uh, I'm, I'm the post laparoscopic, I'm the pre laparoscopic era. And uh, it's something that, you know, if I had to re enter the profession, I'd have to train all over again. What do you say, Radha Krishna? What are your opinion, points of view on that? I absolutely agree with every word what you say, sir. And now uh, surgery is uh, so, so much transformed and, uh, yeah. and there's the newer requirements and actually what you talk uh, is what is relevant now. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's not easy for uh, the present day students to understand the importance of uh, uh, journal reading and interpretation of articles. Yeah, that's where, it, but that won't change, right? That, that won't change in the sense that science will still continue to be there. The right. technology, the intervention may change, but the science behind it stays the same. Whatever you compare, even if you're comparing robotics, again, you have to ask yourself the same question. True then it becomes even more important because the, uh, the user skill, the user's training, all that becomes factors. And any number of surgical trials will show you that the results will depend on who did the surgery. Senior people will get better results than junior people. Or sometimes it's the other way around. Junior people get better results than senior people. But that skill stratification, all that becomes a big issue. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Anjali, do you want to make a comment or ask or to ask her anything? Dr. Anjali? Or anyone who wants to comment? So say high power okay. changes, sir. Yeah. Um, 
If there, there are no comments, then we'll see you again coming week. So we then call it quits, uh, production. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. I, what what I will try and do is also some of the key elements in the slides that I have used. I will put it together and I'll send it across to you if there's some way that you can distribute it to people. They can also keep that as a reference, you know. All, all that material that I have, I can easily convert it into a small PDF. Okay, sure, sir. I'll, I'll do that. Okay. I'll put in the learning journal. Right. Uh, from you, you have to tell me now how do we take this forward? Let's think about it. I'll also think about it. Sure, sir. And uh, certain more concepts I will explain, but that's better done as we go along. It will become a little too academic if I stopped and, you know, took them in. But I think I've covered everything substantially. I've shown you how to take a paper and put it together into a very uh, systematic framework of looking at it. Sure, sir. And uh, I'll, I'll come back to you. I'll we'll discuss. Okay, then. Shall I sign out? Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. And uh, that, thanks. Uh, thank, thank, thank you again. again. Coming uh, week. Yeah. Okay. I'm signing out. Thank you.